Hi, everybody. I am going to be talking about the City of Providence's Every Home Program. This is the initiative that uh, Mayor Alorza announced about a year ago with a very bold vision to <coughs> eradicate all of the city's vacant and abandoned housing over the next six years. So I'm going to walk through um, how we are going to do that, and I'd love to hear your feedback and your questions because this program is evolving um, as we speak. So I'd love to hear your insights about, about how we're going to do this. So again, our goal is to tackle about 100 properties a year over the next six years um, of the mayor's time here. Now, every home has been um, widely sort of associated with the receivership program, and really every home is a suite of tools. So I'm going to go through, talk about each one of the tools and, and how we're using it. Um, and receivership is a really important component of that, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, we are partnering with Rhode Island Housing. Rhode Island Housing has dedicated a $3 million pot of funds as a pool of loan funds for folks that are rehabbing homes, both receivers and private parties. So they're a great partner with us. Um, and we have allocated from our city budget, we have a million dollars that are allocated for vacant and abandoned housing. And I'll be talking about that a little bit more. Um, so here is kind of the suite of tools that we are employing. So right now we are out um, in the neighborhoods. We have a team from Roger Williams University that's doing a comprehensive vacant property survey. So we've talked about this number of vacant properties being 400, 500, 600. Um, every time we talk about it, it's a different number. We really need to nail that down. And so we've teamed up with Roger Williams and for the next two or three months, they have a team of folks out in the field going street by street to come up with our final list of what is the confirmed number of vacant and abandoned properties. We're working with our Department of Inspection and Standards to have a checklist of when this team is out in the field, what are those indicators that they're looking for so that everyone will be using that same checklist so we have that comprehensive list. So in about two to three months, we'll be able to say that number is 563 or whatever that number is. Um, we're also doing a comprehensive data of all properties, all 44,000 parcels in the city. I'll be talking about that in a minute. Um, we are being a lot more aggressive about citing properties with code violations and getting them in the housing court system. And when doing that, that sort of opens up a suite of legal tools, receivership, and other tools that we'll talk about a little bit more. Um, and then I mentioned the, the city investment through our CDBG program in vacant and abandoned housing. We also have, <coughs> on the other side of the spectrum, investments for homeowner repair programs to make sure that we are preventing additional properties from coming into this pipeline. So fixing some of those home repairs um, early on <coughs> so that, that homeowners don't walk away from those properties and next year those become our vacant and abandoned properties. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what we're doing around vacant lots. Um, I, I, this is basically what I already told you about Roger Williams, um, how they're going to do this, and uh, the team that we have in place. So the property um, data inventory that we're doing, I'm teaming up with a group called Opportunity Space out of Boston. And um, what we, originally our plan was to really create a comprehensive inventory for those 600 or 500 properties. And the more we talked about it, the more we realized what we really need is an inventory of all 44 parcel, 44,000 parcels in the city. So working with Opportunity Space, they, their software engineers are going to be able to pull live data from all of the different systems that we use in the city. So our law department, Department of Inspection and Standards, planning, um, police department, we all have our unique system of how we track data. This group is going to be able to live pull that data into one source so that we can be really using the data in a comprehensive way to be more strategic. So here are some of the things that we're going to be looking at. Um, Kevin and Barry, um, are part of our team here, can attest to the list being 10 times longer than this, but I just wanted to highlight some of the things. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so ownership, zoning, use and size, some basic property stats. And then we want to know what are the outstanding taxes, both the amount of taxes and the periods of outstanding taxes. So the past three or four cycles there, that there's outstanding taxes because that gives us a better indicator of uh, potential problems on the horizon. 
Um, Providence Water leans, um, clean leans from our DPW department and boarding leans from our inspections department. Um, housing code violations, has there been a first, second, third violation? Are they in some kind of housing court process? And then police and fire calls, for example. So we can start to really strategize. <coughs> if we draw a line around a neighborhood and we say, show the properties that have had three or more uh, police calls or fire calls in the last month and have outstanding taxes and there's a province water room, just for an example, that's going to highlight properties that if they are not on our radar are going to be on our radar very soon or properties that are a heavy drain of city resources and that we really need to start targeting. So um, everyone talks about using data to drive decision making. I think that's like the thing to say right now about everything, but this really is the intent of this program is to use all of this information to drive our decision making and our strategy about how we are going after these vacant and abandoned structures and, and vacant lots. Okay, I am going to turn over this point to my colleague Kevin Mahoney. He's the deputy director at the Department of Inspection and Standards, and he knows this stuff a lot better than I do. So I'm going to let him walk through the housing code <coughs> violation process and how um, we're going after properties and banks. I'm making you come up. Hi. <laughs> um, so one of the things we looked at is uh, the problem of properties just becoming vacant, remaining vacant, and what we could do about it. So the first thing we actually did was to prevent the grabbing a piece of property, holding onto it, and flipping it for a profit, profit and leaving it the way it is. So when, when properties now have a violation or a lien on it, we do not allow that property to transfer without an agreement between the current owner and the city as to any fines or fees that would do on it, but also an affidavit signed by the buyer as to them recognizing that these violations were issued and an agreement as to how much time it would take for them to abate those violations. And they actually are doing that in court in front of a judge so that they're making a motion to intervene as the defendant and so they just can't buy the property, sit on it, and maybe in six months or eight months get a few thousand dollars more and move on. We, we've also tried to um, understanding that there are different groups of people that own houses, someone that's an owner-occupied house that they could have, someone who may have inherited a property and, and they don't live there but they own it, and then certainly an investor that, that's out trying to buy a bunch of properties and a bank that owns a property. And we've tried to, um, the process remains the same. We issue the violations, a first NOV, a second NOV, and it goes into court if it's not abated. But our approach with those people change depending upon who it is. And, and our objective is to try to get into a situation that if the people who are owner-occupied, that we might have a program available where they might be able to get some funds to be able to, uh, to improve the home or abate the fines that we've issued with them. Certainly that, that attitude a little bit with the second group that, that may not necessarily have just gone out to try to buy it for profit and then and see what happens. And the other ones, we've kind of just turned the game up a little bit on them in, in going after um, banks, going after investors and saying, hey, you're not going to do this. A number of people that, that make a living doing this are no longer making that living because of the change that we've made in that process. Um, thank you very much. The, and, and certainly any questions that, that you, know, you have that I can, I can answer at the best I could. The receivership program is another tool that's being used and essentially what's happening with that is the, the, uh, the city would go before a judge and ask the judge to appoint a receiver on a temporary receivership basis to, to, to step into the shoes of the person that owned the property that wasn't doing what they were supposed to be doing. So the property's vacant, it's blighted, it's abandoned, and, uh, and so the, the court can appoint a receiver, a temporary receiver of that property. His job at that point is to go out and to advertise, to secure the property, to insure the property, to advertise um, to any interested parties, mortgagees or anybody, that there would be a hearing a month from them to him, for him to be appointed a permanent receiver on that property. When he becomes that permanent receiver, or when that hearing occurs, Either the mortgagee can come in and object to that appointment and, and explain why they would object. And, uh, and, and, if, if, and then the receiver would present to the court his plan, would have a construction person there, a real estate person there, 
They're going to invest X amount of dollars into totally rehabbing the property. They're going to market it, <coughs> try to find an owner-occupied person that might buy the property. Um, and, and to have the whole plan in place that the court would say, okay, we like your plan and, uh, and we're going to go with you as a receiver. A quick example of what could happen on that is that one of the first ones we did, um, the bank came in and objected to the permanent receiver status after the temporary status was, was granted. And the receiver came in with a plan to spend $125,000 to rehab the house. And the court allowed the bank to come up with a plan and come back in two weeks. So two weeks later they had a hearing and the bank came back and said we're going to board the property and we're going to secure it and make sure that it's not a hazard to anybody in the neighborhood. And, and we objected to that saying that it's a problem in the neighborhood even if they board it. So the judge allowed the bank to go back two weeks after that with a plan that, that someone might have mirrored the plan that the receiver had proposed. Well the bank went back and the lawyers went back to the bank and said hey we've got to compete with $120,000 rehab. They were already owed $90,000 that the person had walked away from. So they certainly weren't going to invest $210,000, so they didn't object anymore. The receiver does the property, goes through the whole thing, reports back to the court all the time, and at the end of the process, then, then has a hearing that allows bids to occur as to who wants to buy the property. And the, people, the city's paid back, the, the investors paid back, the receivers paid, the, obviously the construction person has been paid all along, and any money left over would actually go to the bank who held the original mortgage on it. But that, in a nutshell, is a description of a receivership program, coming from a guy, by the way, that's not a lawyer, so if you have any more questions on it. But, um, but that's, that's one of the tools that we're using to try to eliminate these vacant properties, along with picking up the housing court, the pressure on people in housing court. Yes. Does the city ever take title to the properties, or does that try to be avoided? So, if there are uh, if there are seven, six, seven, eight different tools that the city is trying to use or exploring to use to correct this problem, that's one of them. Is to try to figure out a way to do that. Yes. I know when this first started, the banks were being rather unhelpful. Are you finding that they're coming forward a little bit? I mean, your, your load must be a little bit less nowadays, so... I'm finding nothing's changed. <laughs> I, can, I can tell you this. I, I think that, um, that Rhode Island Housing has been very cooperative in wanting to be involved in it. I've been to neighborhood meetings where local banks have been there and given me their card and they want to be interested in it. But, um, but no, there's not... Bank of America is those oh, no. guys. <laughs> <laughs> I, had a, I had an email uh, from someone that asked me how much I would settle for a fine on a piece of property from, from a bank, a big bank, and I wrote them back and said it would be $10,000. And they sent me an email two weeks later and they said to me, well, how much will it be to settle that fine? You know, we'd like to do something with the property. And I said $10,000. And they sent me a third email two weeks later saying the same thing. So the fourth time they sent an email to the mayor an email to my boss and an email to their boss saying that I was blocking the way for them to try to do what they wanted to do. And how much would it be to get out of it? And I said 15,000. <laughs> and my boss said, where'd you come up with the 15? And I said 10, because that's the original thing in the five, because they really ticked me off. They kept asking me the same question. So the cooperation is non-existent. Except for local banks. I think I wanted to just add that I think Kevin um, has actually been very successful by going through this process of the notice of violation and keeping on it and being aggressive with the banks. We are seeing a lot more fines being paid back. So not that the banks are being more cooperative, but Kevin and his team are being much more proactive. And the results are that the city is getting additional income coming in through the payment. Banks are coming to the table to say, okay, how much to just get out of this and that's a new thing because of the aggressive enforcement on, on your side so just wanted to mention that. You want to get me off the stage? No, <laughs> no, I'm going to bring you right back up here. Okay. Just, I you. just had to, a few other things. One is um, I mentioned um, in our budget, the CDBG budget this year, we worked with the city council to carve out a $900,000 pot to invest in vacant and abandoned property citywide. So with that pot we're partnering mostly with our CDCs 
to um, really look at those properties that um, the market just can't handle on its own. So these are properties that there's there's a big gap between the cost to rehab the property and what you can get it in, in rent or for sale. So in those cases, we have this PG <coughs> pot ready to go, um, and we have a number of projects that we've identified. They will all be finalized this spring, and our goal is to get all that money out the door um, by May of this year. And then I mentioned we also have a smaller pot that we are trying to prevent additional properties from coming into the pipeline. So um, we carved out, again, from our CDBG budget with the help of the city council, a specific pot to prevent vacant and abandoned housing. Um, and that money was uh, gone the second we announced it, because the demand is, is really, really good for, for that kind of a product. And then lastly, I just wanted to mention, um, we're really doing some innovative thinking about vacant lots. Um, this is just an example. We've done a lot of planning work citywide and have identified kind of um, key locations around the city that we want to direct investment in. Um, in those areas, we've looked at lots that are um, either vacant or um, really underutilized, and how can we group those lots with what's happening around it? Um, and we've been, been able to come up with several different strategies. Um, this spring I'm working with a RISD class to develop a um, tiny, tiny house model, a sustainable tiny house that can be used on these vacant lots that will have a Providence look and feel and that will have the ability to scale up. So it's really, I'm really, really excited about this. It's really fun. Um, by the end of um, the spring semester, we'll have kind of a prototype and we're going to be shopping around to different manufacturers of different materials and looking for um, investors not to do a single model on a single lot, but to look at maybe 100 vacant lots and really try to scale up this program. Really excited about it. And then, of course, all of these other things, um, side yards and tree farms and all of these other things that we know temporary um, temporary installations, all of these things that can um, help to activate these vacant lots that are really scattered throughout our neighborhood. So if we have 600 vacant and abandoned housing um, structures, we have that at least that number of vacant lots. So every home is um, really focused on the structures, but every home is really about every block. We know that if we fix a vacant or abandoned house and there's uh, three vacant lots around it, we haven't really done it. And we really need to look at this on a block by block strategy, and um, that's that's what we're doing. Thank you. No, let's do questions now. Okay, sure. Go ahead. Are you going to permit multiple tiny houses on the lot, or just one? So it really depends on the lot. So it's it's difficult to prototype this because our lots range in size from <coughs> 6,000 square feet to 2,500. So um, it's going to depend on um, what zone, you know, what zone are the lots in. There's commercial vacant lots as well as, uh, you know, residential lots. So it, it really depends on on each lot what's going to be permitted there. What's tiny? Um, in the six to eight hundred square feet range. Yeah. I know that one question I has come up is obviously the program called Every Home is targeting. Um, homes and residential properties, but what about commercial properties in the city that have just sat and vacant? Is, there, is that incorporated in the program in any way? Could the same tools be used for commercial property? Yeah. I think that's a really good point. The receivership program has kind of um, looked at... I just want to make sure. Did everybody hear the question? No. Okay, this is... Uh, we're, we're looking at residential structures through every home. That's, that's really the goal. But what about commercial structures? Can we use some of those same tools? But the answer is really yes. Um, the mayor has a very, um, very strong commitment to repurposing and making these units available for housing. That's really the goal of this program. But in all the planning work that we do and all of the commercial corridor work that we do, we are very keenly aware of vacant mill structures and commercial structures and have a series of um, you know, tools and techniques to employ. Some of them are similar. Uh, receivers can take a commercial property. It's a little different. Um, we have to, I think, be very very careful about what the outcome is in, in a lot of cases. But, but yes, we are addressing that as well. But that's a good point. Thank you. Any other questions? I think um, we have a question. Is uh, there a strategy that you guys have in place to utilize any of the units you're creating for low income or addressing homelessness within the city? Yeah, so 
The $900,000 pot is specifically to uh, create affordable housing. So that's uh, working with the CDCs. And as all of these tools are employed, the receivership program, um, once it's appointed to a receiver, the city doesn't have really all that much control of what happens. It's going to be really market driven. But all of the other tools, when the city takes properties through tax title um, and all of those other tools that we talked about, we have much more control over the outcome. So when we look at a particular neighborhood, what are the needs of that neighborhood? Do we want to encourage rental housing or mo more home, home ownership in that neighborhood? So um, yes, absolutely, affordable housing is one of the primary goals of the program. And then um, I get to ask a question because I'm up here with the mic, sure. and so I'm going to ask you about healthy housing because that's my job. Yes. Um, yes. But just thinking about um, are there um, opportunities in um, in the guidance that you're giving um, to make sure that um, investments are energy efficient and um, safe and healthy and those kinds of things? Um, again, for the properties that we have more control over, yes. So when we are funding the property uh, rehab, absolutely. We have a Green and Healthy Homes initiative um, that, and we have a lead initiative. So we have a lot of other um, tools and programs to address those particular needs. But with those ones, they yeah. have to be um, occupied. So for the for the, right. Right. the vacant. So yeah. again, for the properties that we end up having more control over through the tax title process, for example, or that we are funding, we have more control to check for those types of things to make sure that it's sustain that there are sustainable elements, etc. For the receivership properties, not as much because the city doesn't really have a role to play so much as um, working with the courts to match up receivers with properties, so our ability to sort of step in is, is much more minimal on, on that side. Are there other questions? Hard to see. Okay, yeah, thanks. <laughs> uh, to the question about affordable housing, I'm wondering if there's this is paired with any um, effort to keep residents in their homes in the first place who are falling behind on rent or mortgages or, or are the victims of default evictions to prevent lots from being vacant in the first place. Yeah, that's a good point and something that we have talked a lot about internally. Right now, the tool that we have in place is really to help people with the, the structure of their home more than helping if, if they're falling behind financially. So we have tools to help with home repair. That's, that's sort of the, the extent of the, the tools that we have on that end.